I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies. I'm Harley Shaken, the chair of the center, and we're very pleased to have with us tonight two guests from Colombia. A professor, uh, Ramirez Restrepo, uh, from the University of Antioquia, Lucrecia Ramirez Restrepo. Uh, and Governor Sergio Fajardo, who will be speaking. Uh, <laughs> Governor Fajardo, in my view, has inspiring rhetoric and writing and transforming work and practice. And I would like to give a very brief introduction, but reflecting on the inspiring rhetoric and the transforming practice, I'm going to do it in two parts. A brief biography before the talk and a very quick comment after the talk. Sergio Fajardo was mayor of Medellin from 2003 to 2007 where he did some inspiring work in the city and in addressing the social issues that Medellin faced. Uh, he has been governor of Antioquia, the most populous and important state economically in Colombia from 2012 through today. And he will be speaking tonight on education, as the agent of transformation. Please join me in welcoming Sergio Fajardo. So good afternoon. Thank you, Harley. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you. I see some known faces. I'm going to tell you about our story. But the first chapter, the first th thing that I want to show you is this.
that's our state anthem. We produced this video last year in order to celebrate our independence. We have been, Antioquia was independent 200 years ago. But the reason I wanted to show you is you get a feeling where we come from. I come from people from Antioquia. Actually, this could be seen, of course, it is part of Colombia. Our colors, our faces, our voices, our mountains, rivers, whatever. We have it there, and I wanted you to have an idea about Antioquia. And now, with that idea in mind, then, let's get to Antioquia, the most educated. I want to locate our country. Here's the United States. We are around here. Here's Colombia, the top of South America. We intersect here with Panama. I always make this remark, Panama used to be ours. That's not the subject today. But at the upper, in this part of Colombia, there is Antioquia, the state of Antioquia. And that's Antioquia. We have, for those of you who have some idea about Colombia, this is the Magdalena River on the east side of Antioquia. The Cauca River goes through the middle of Antioquia between the mountains. The Atrato River goes to the Pacific very close to the Pacific here, there's a jungle limiting with Chocó. And up there we have the Caribbean. We have the second largest coast on the Caribbean from Colombia. The Andes Mountains get there. Actually, the Andes Mountains come from Chile. When they come into Colombia, they split into three branches. And two of those die off here in Antioquia when they finish South America. And Antioquia is divided in nine regions, right in the middle of Antioquia in the mountains. It's Medellin, right here. And we have 125 municipalities, around six and a half million people. And we have an incredible mixture there. In Antioquia, everything happens. Nothing at a low key. We are always at the stream, for good or for bad sometimes. But that's Antioquia. That's my state. That's where we come from. I come from, I mean, some of us come from. And let me tell you why I'm here. And I always like to take some time because what I'm going to tell you now is the most important thing that I tell you, I can tell you. I can show many things that we do. But I want to go with you and share what has been the main reasons behind what we have done. Because if, actually I shouldn't be here today as a governor of Antioquia. That, was, that wasn't my life project. I never thought I would come to Berkeley as a governor of Antioquia. I, I had come, and here I have a friend who is at the Mathematical Science Research Institute up here. I came here a few years ago to spend a month as a mathematician. And if I were go, supposed to come here, it was like what I was. I used to be a professor of mathematics, a scientist, doing mathematics, but now as I'm a, I am as a, here as I'm a governor, and I'm going to tell you why. And it all has to do with politics. This is a little personal, but I, I like to explain it to you, and I like it, actually, to tell you the story. This all began about 14 and a half years ago. A group of friends from, the, from Medellin, we got together, and we shared two thoughts. The first one was we have been working for many years. I myself, as a scientist, as a university professor, I was a member of the Colombian National Science Council in Basic Sciences, trying to make sure that science was part of our culture in our country. I was a member of the National Committee on Masters and PhD programs to make sure that many people could get Masters and PhD programs in Colombia. I myself would write newspaper columns saying many things about education, how important it was for our society. But everything that I wrote and I did at the end, the final line was, this should be done. And we got with a group of friends from different sectors, NGOs, the cultural uh, community in Medellin, academic community. And we all, at the end, were saying exactly the same. This should be done. And then, who is supposed to do it? 
And the answer is politicians are the ones who take the most important decision in our society, regardless of whether we like them or not. We didn't. So we said, what are we going to do now? And we made a decision. We said, we are going to organize ourselves. We are going to build a civic, independent political movement. And we are going to get into power in Medellin. And we are going to transform this society. That was 14 years and a half and ago. Less people than the one we have here, less than 50 persons. And we got together and said, that's what we are going to do. And that's why I'm here. I was leading that group. That was the decision that we made. People laughed at us at the beginning. They don't laugh at us right now. But that's the origin. And that's something that happened in our lives. And it has been extraordinary. With, as, it, as it is interesting in life, complex, difficult sometimes, but it has been a joyful path that we have been following. And how we began. This group of people, we got together. We were all friends. So we knew that we shared things. But we sat down, as we mathematicians do, and said, let's write down all those basic principles that we really share. Those principles that we are committed to in order to build the transformation of the society that we want. And we wrote them down. In mathematical terms, would be the axioms. We wrote down the axioms that identify ourselves. And then we posed the problems that we wanted to solve. We still want to solve on them, those problems. We are still working on those problems. The problems were inequality. We live in a very unequal society. We don't accept inequality as, as part of our lives. We want to strive for equality in order to live in a just society. Uh, I've been talking to some friends here and saying inequality is a new world in the United States. When I was a student here, nobody talked about inequality. It didn't happen here. Now everyone is talking about inequality in the United States, but we have known about inequality for centuries. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> violence. We know and you know what the problem means, violence for us. And the culture of illegality, which has corruption as a main chapter. Those were the three problems that we posed. And then we have been working on the solution of those problems. We got into power. I may tell you more about that later. But we, when we got in Medellin, our program was Medellin, the most educated. Medellin is not the most educated. Antioquia is not the most educated, but that's our challenge. That's a way of expressing. We are going to make of education the engine of social transformation. I'll tell you more about that as I, as I move along. And that's what we have been doing. And actually, as a civic independent political movement, we won the election when I was the candidate for mayor of Medellin. That was our first public appearance in, public, uh, in a public position. I had never had any position in the public sector whatsoever before. And then a friend of mine came, a, part of our, a member of our group came after I finished. In Colombia, we have no re-election, immediate re-election of mayors or governors. And then now I'm governor, governor of Antioquia. So it had been 14 years and a half since we began doing this, and here we go. And the key to the whole thing has been something that I write here in this formula. We have been coherent. That means every step that we take never contradicts previous steps that we have taken. And we have been consistent. We have kept the same principles. We don't change principles regarding or where I'm talking to or what problem we are facing. In mathematics, that's very well known in mathematics. And if we change principles depending on what problem you are going to solve, that's very easy to solve the problem. But we have kept the same principles. And after all this year, we have been coherent and consistent. And what we have produced, the capital, the political capital that we have, which is powerful, is trust. People trust us. We have never paid for a vote. We have never paid any person to be part of us, to bring us voters, as it happens many places in the world, in Latin America directly. Here, they buy the votes in another form. But in Colombia and other places, they pay this much for each vote. We haven't paid anything. We have built something that has no price, which is trust. You cannot buy trust, and that's our political power. That's what we have been doing, and that's the key for everything that comes afterwards. I'm not going to explain you more than, than that, but here I have an illustration. 
That's my handwriting. I prepare my talks as I used to prepare my classes. I still do it. And it's a very simple explanation, but helps us understand to understand what we do. Here's the inequality tree. This is the violence tree, and that's the illegality tree. Think of three trees. Each one is separate from the other. Now, if you look downwards, if you look at the roots, after all these years, the roots have been going downwards. And after all these years, they are all untangled here. So from the outside, from the, the, ¿cómo se dice el nivel? The surface, thank you. They look like three different trees. But if you look carefully, you understand that they end up being a single tree because they have just one root. After all these years, there is one single root to the three trees. So if you want to uproot them, you have to do it simultaneously. And that inspires what we do politically. And it has to do with this graphic that I have here. And now I'm going to explain you the fundamentals. This is crucial for all what we do. You can talk a lot, you can explain many things, many people can do many things, but this is the, these are the key issues that we face and that we have used throughout all these years. And that's the key, those are the fundamentals for all what we do. At the beginning, we work on this concept, dignity. Roughly speaking, very simple. Dignity means we are equally valuable as human beings, all of us. There's no difference. We talk about the respect, and for everyone, we recognize that we all have capabilities. And we all need recognition. Those are four crucial concepts that we have there that are very powerful. From, and that l those concepts lead us to what we do. You are going to see the concepts in action. Politics. This is all about politics. This is not a, an ex, uh, expert's uh, work. This is all politics. All decisions that we politicians make, we are in power, we make decisions, and we affect society. But there is something crucial. As opposed to the end justify the means, which is a statement very well known, and that holds true in many aspects, or what is done in the political life, we say the means are the ones that justify the end, the process. How you get into power will determine how you govern, and that will make a complete difference. Usually people say, well, we have to get into power. But once we get into power, we are going to do extraordinary things. But in order to get there, many things will go. That's the fallacy. That's the worst thing that can happen. And they say, politicians know how to win the elections, but once the election is won, wonderful thing happens. Never. That's false. So it's how you get in there that determines how you govern. And that's very simple, but very powerful. And if you go throughout Colombia, let's say, then you will see what it means when I'm saying these things here. The problems, another way of expressing them. Inequality, one way of explaining inequality, I'll show it to you a little later, is there is no path. There are many human beings in Colombia, most, that say there, there is no path for me to follow here in this society. Violence. The power of violent people is fear. They instill fear in us. And once we are fearful, then the society gets fragmented. You have to survive. That's your daily task, survive. So the society is divided in pieces. You cannot move into this place. You will never talk to this one. You will never move in there. And everyone is being restricted, fearful. And that's the power of violent people. Illegality, as I said, it, the end justified the means. Anyway, you get there, but you have to get there. And that's the legal world. And corruption, that's something extraordinary that happens not only in Colombia, throughout the world. You see all this corruption going you may be very elegant in many powerful countries throughout Latin America, all over. Corruption is all over. But at the end, corruption means that public richness becomes crumbs. You, div you take the money, the corrupt people take the money, they put the money in their pockets, and they leave something out to give out to people. And they take away opportunities. They make sure that people 
continuously continues to be poor and they have to kneel in front of the powerful. And we say we, have, we don't have to kneel in front of anyone, anywhere. In church, that's your problem. But here, we don't have to kneel in front of anyone. And that's dignity. And corruption is a way of taking dignity out of people. The key to the whole thing is the community. But something crucial. I, I, I have never been in an election in my life before being mayor candidate for mayor of Medellin. But we learned a lot. Usually, there is a statement, a very well-known phrase, at least for us, in order to believe, you have to see. Santo Tomas. Okay? Now, we claim that with communities, with community, if you take community seriously, the first thing that we have to do is people have to understand. I am a professor, and I continue to be a professor, and I will be a professor forever. But you have to take into account people and take the time and the care to explain to everyone. You may be very humble, but anyone can understand. And that's a professor's job, making sure that you have the language and you have to express and take them very seriously. And that's dignity, and that's respect, and that's crucial, explaining to people what we do. I'll tell you more about that. People have to see. You have to th see things. For example, we move very easily in, the, in abstract concepts. I'll give you an example of an abstract concept. The quality of education. The quality of education, you can talk about it. We discuss the same issues here in the United States or in Colombia because the kids should do better in math and sciences. They should be able to reason, logic, and all these things. But that, for most people in our society, is something completely abstract. They have nothing to do with them. For example, giving you another example, many times within the business world and government world, people talk about we have to be competitive. We have to be competitive, that's for sure. We have to good highways, airports, all these things to be able to be part of the world. But our project, our political project, is not to be competitive. Our problem, our project is human development. And you have to be competitive within that. Of course, we are not against that, but we are working towards human development. Or I'll give you another example. You sh we are going through peace negotiations in Colombia. And some people from the businessman say, businessmen sector, they say, uh, that's the best business that you can have. If we have peace, we will be very rich. And I said, that's a mistake. We are going to change this society. I'm sure there is profit in having a peaceful society. But when you look from that narrow point of view, you miss the point. And with communities, you have to take that into account. The community has to understand, have to see, they have to feel, to believe. And that's crucial. I'll explain you a little bit about that later. I said that violence and all these factors is fragment society. So we have to put together the pieces of our society. And where do we get together? In the public space. So how we get together into the public space in a city like Medellin, in a state like Antioquia? This is not a general recipe. And this is something important that I want to share with you. It works for us, and I'm doing, explaining our context. Some people go there and say, I'm going to do this in order to solve this problem. I am very worried. They said, these guys are not going to get the solution because we have a very particular problem. For example, the violence that we have in Medellin compared to Bogota, it's completely different. Fortunately, Bogota, because we had something terrible in our, the violence in Medellin, but it's, co it's a completely different setting. It doesn't work. The same things don't go, don't hold through in both places. So we have to get into the public space. And in the public space, what we have to do in Medellin, in Antioquia, is change the skin of the city, of the public space, where you have seen the violence, you have seen blood many times. We are going to change that. And we are going to build new spaces in order to get together. But those have to be the most beautiful places for the humblest people. But it's not a, a pro, an architect's project. Is the beautiful places will replace the blood. We'll have new skin. We could be able to dream. Because violence and corruption, one of the things that they took away, take away is dignity and the ability to dream, to have something interesting, to, to be able to dream in life. So when we, be, when we say the most beautiful 
places for the humblest people is a powerful message about dignity. And then we have to connect the pieces. We have to put together the city. And we, of course, we have mobility and many things that we have to do in order to put together the city to resemble what we do. And the power, the power that we have really built in all these things is that we are talking about the education. Education for us is in the sense of the 21st century. Education traditionally means school. And school means long term. We are going to improve in math in Antioquia and in Colombia. It will take many years. So people are worried and say, well, but if you work on education, that's long term. You are never going to see things. And in politics, there is no long term. Nobody works in politics saying, I'm doing this, but 30 years from now, people will see what we did. That doesn't work. We have to do it a daily affair, and that's what we do. So we have to understand education in a very broad sense. Education, science, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, culture, all these places where your capabilities get expressed. And I'll give you some examples of what we mean by that. Of course, we pay attention to schools. We are paying attention to schools in Europe. And we mobilize the whole society around the world education. Wherever I go in Colombia, people tell me, Antioquia, the most educated. And I say, good. They are in my channel. They are talking about education. We are not the most educated. That's a challenge. But people start looking at that, understanding, and we are connecting to people through the world. And then we work with that word and open up the, the portfolio, the ideas that we have. So what we know how to do or what we have done at the end is we have moved from fear to hope. And I'm going to show you with the next graphic that I have, the wall and the door, how, what I mean by from fear to hope and how another way of looking at the problems that we are facing and that would help us to understand the problem better. And here it is. For most people in Colombia, you sit, uh, you stand here, look forward, and what you see in front? You see a huge wall right in front of you. Huge. And on the side, you see a door. The wall is the inequality wall. You know what is behind the wall opportunities on this side, but you don't see any way how are you going to pass that wall in order to get to the opportunities. And on the side you see a door, here's the entrance door, to the illegal and violent world. They are all together. So you have this, then you have the door to the entrance, and you ask yourself which way I go. Here you ask the question how, and for this, they say, why not? You know that you move through this door, and you get here, and you get opportunities between quotation mark. But there is a very fine line moving from here to here. So for many people, they said, I'll go through this door. There is a door that I can go through. I cannot go through the wall. This is a cartoon, but it helps me explain what we really do. And what we have to do is the following. We have to close this door. We would like to close it. We can't. It's very difficult. And how wide it is depends where you are standing. In Medellin, in Antioquia, it's wide, unfortunately. But we have to make it narrower, narrower. So as we make it narrower, then it will be more difficult to go through it. But in order to make it narrower, two people are here. We have to open up through this wall, many doors, what we call the doors of opportunity, that you can go through this wall, but you can pass. And that's what we do. So what is the meaning of hope? When this guy here looks in front and see the wall, but they, the guy sees doors that they can go through. They may be far, but they eventually see something different. The only door that they, most people see in many places in Colombia and Antioquia is this one. When we open up the doors of opportunities, people see and they recognize that there is a possibility. And when they see that, they have hope. It doesn't mean that the problems have been solved, but they start seeing and say, I can. And when you see that, then whatever path you take, because we have to open up many doors, but whatever path you take, 
you have to go through a first station. And the first station is education. You have to build on education in order to be able to walk along those, the door of opportunities. And that's what we do. What we have been doing is solving the problem that I post here and the way I explain it to you, and that's what we do. And I'm going to show you a little bit about how it works. Because I could take two hours explaining the whole thing. I'll try to be a little faster. But I wanted to make sure that this was understood. This is the, the foundation of what we do. This is the motivation for what we do. So for example, what, the way we did politics, and we have done it, since we don't belong to any po traditional political party, we went directly to citizens in Medellin. And we walked, physically walked throughout the city, handing out our leaflets, explaining what we had in mind about, what, about our society. We walked directly to people. And what we did, and we managed to do, and we have done since that day where we began 14 years and ago, and a half ago, where people laughed at us saying, these guys are crazy. I mean, these guys are going to defeat the liberal and the conservative party in Medellin, two and a half million people, the city of Medellin, with all the meaning of Medellin, and here they come, this professor is saying that they are going to change the society. Now, as I said, they don't laugh at us, but we walked. We walked throughout the city. We talked to people directly. We, had to, we don't have to ask permission to anyone to go wherever we wanted to go. And we established a relationship so that we had the city in our senses, in our skin. We smelled it, we saw it, we touched the city. We saw its people around the city all over the place. We love this deeply. I do love deeply. I cannot more love Medellin anymore because it's not possible. But we loved it and we felt it. And we showed people how, we much, how much we love it. And we always studied. We paid attention. We learned what has been done in other places. We thought about it. So we put together senses, skin, heart, and the brain, the reason. And that's the formula that we have been using. That means well, you still have time. <laughs> so I'm going to jump very much. And I'm going to move to explain a little bit about education. And I'm going to move into Antioquia now. Because at the end, we have been doing the same thing since we began. We have been following this path. Medellin, our capital, the territory, the people, and now we have extended to Antioquia. Antioquia, for example, uh, the population of Norway would fit into Antioquia. Uruguay would fit two and a half times in Antioquia, the population. Antioquia is bigger than many Central American countries. Antioquia is quite a big space, complex, very interesting, it's an expression of Colombia. We have a huge mixture there, diversity, which is part of our richness, as you saw in the video. So I'm going to jump quickly to tell you just a part of what we do, but it's, this is the crucial part. We all have to build roads, we have to build hospitals, we have to make sure that public services work, many things that we, all governors have to do all over the world. But I'm going to explain to you how we mobilize the whole society around education. And that's very interesting. And this is a path that we have designed, we have built, and we enjoy it very much. And I explain it to you here. My wife doesn't like this picture here, but it, it, I need it like that. So first, the first thing is we have to talk to the whole society. Everyone is part of our project. We are not just working for the poor people or the handicapped or whoever. We work for the whole society. And we have to explain. Always explain. Take the time to explain. People understand. Usually in politics, politicians don't care about people. They don't take the time to explain seriously. We take very seriously explaining what we do. That's the least that we could expect from a professor. A, move, a movement led by a professor. So we explain. So again, the name is powerful. To have someone walking around, and we were in Seattle, and I'm walking there, and somebody told I have no idea where I am, I mean, who I'm talking to, and says, Antioquia, the most educated, that's very powerful. It's very difficult to get people to 
talk about education and have the word in their minds. So we have them. So let me put an example of something that will never happen. In Colombia, as I'm sure here in many states, we have been discussing about the quality of math, uh, of education. As I claim, that's an abstract concept. The experts say the problem, the reason, the same here in the United States as in Colombia, and it's written in newspapers by very smart people, good people. They said the problem is the teachers. Teachers are very bad. So we have, we have to improve the education, change the teachers. And they tell you, do as in Finland. In Finland, the best students go to study education. In Colombia, the worst students go to study education. <laughs> and they tell everyone is a bad teacher, and we have to improve the quality of teachers. We have to pay more and get the best students to be teachers. And we claim that's false. I mean, that's the wrong way to solve the problem. To begin with, it's a contradiction in terms. How come you're going to tell the teachers that, that they are the worst? In Antioquia, we claim, in Antioquia, there is not a single teacher. And actually, we use Spanish. So we talk about maestras and maestros. Because most teachers, 80% are women. But we talk about maestros. So we talk about maestras and maestros and say, in Antioquia, all teachers are good, but all can improve. I will never will tell a professor or a teacher that you are bad. You are good, but you can improve. And we change the way we talk about the whole thing. So you, for example, you think that in a small town in the mountains of Antioquia, you saw the mountains, 10,000 people, they are worried about the results in the PISA proof uh, test. <laughs> Not a single human being is worried about their results. And they tell you, you have to do better in math. Nobody cares. Do you think that a, a mayor in Antioquia is worried about the result in the national standard? The tests are not standardized. That's an, the national test, not a single one. It has nothing to do with their lives. Nothing happens. Whether we are last or first in PISA, it doesn't make any change in their lives. But we have to work on education. So what we do is the following. And I'm going to move from the top to the bottom, and I'll, then I'll show you some pictures and I finish. Quickly, what we did, for example, we create the premio, the prize, Antioquia, the most educated. And we honor teachers' experiences, schools all over the place where they have something interesting to say and show. Interesting, seriously interesting. We began doing that in Medellin, the year 2004. We have been, done, been doing that from all these years. We go live on our public TV station. It's the most important day. That day I wear a tie. As a symbol, said, this is very elegant. <laughs> we are talking about teachers and people here. And we get to recognize people who in our society nobody sees because nobody sees teachers in, in Colombia. Nobody sees them. They don't exist. They talk about the bad teachers, but they will never exist. We make them exist. You can visibly see these maestras and maestros and honor them by the work that they do. So what we did, we created something very interesting, which is the Knowledge Olympics in Antioquia. We had our own test. We have our own test in order to measure math, language, and civic competences. But we do, it. we do it. And everyone in Antioquia wants to take the test. All mayors in Antioquia want to make sure that in their schools, their kids do well in the test. And of course, in the test, when we get the result, we do very poorly math. It's not that with our test we do well. We do very poorly. But everyone knows about our test. And in all schools, they know about it. Because with each mayor, we sign a quality pact. Every town. And every school, we sign a quality pact and say, we are going to improve. And we have a baseline. Very simple. How many kids go to higher education? Nobody knew. And nobody cared. But we said, well, now, from now on, we are going to care. We are going to make sure. And we put some very basic references. And with the mayor, who is the most important person in town, we, we sign this with the educational community and the whole community. And we sign and say, we have, a, we have signed a pact because we are going to prove in education. And we put some uh, challenges, very basic challenges, year by year. But every mayor is committed to improving. And the mayor, for the first time, knows where the teachers are. 
Because he has to take care of them. He has to pay attention. If you don't pay attention, they will do things. So we get the whole community committed. And everyone is taking the, the test that we are giving. So it's not a problem with the unions or not. Everyone wants to take the test. Everyone wants to do well. And I can tell you right now in Antioquia, in all schools in Antioquia, all teachers with the communities want to improve. But we, we have been working with them. But isn't, we are not saying you are bad, and now you have to do better because you are very bad. But you're saying we are good, and we are going to improve. And we have this challenge for next year. And people like that when they feel recognized in their dignity, in the, with respect, and we bet on their capabilities. So we move Antioquia all over the place. All towns know about the education. All towns know about this. The, the Olympics go live on TV. And this small town, this girl that belongs to this very poor family is the best student in, their, in her town. And they had never seen a woman who is a good student. And suddenly they see this girl appear on, live on TV, winning a fellowship, winning things for her family and so on. And we move. The whole society is saying, look what we can do. And that's very powerful. Everyone knows about it. We haven't changed the whole situation, but we have changed the attitude. We have opened up something that we had closed in, Colombia, in Antioquia. So we have to do many things about education, digital education is important. We, because you go to a, to a town and the mayor will tell you, we need to repair all schools in Antioquia. All the schools is, are about to collapse. We need computers all over the place. But they will never talk about teachers or things like that. We have to rebuild many schools. And we make them the most beautiful places in the whole town. The quality of education begins by the dignity of the space. Some people say, but the problem is not the building. Yes, it is. We want to have the teacher from public education in very poor neighborhoods having the best school. It's a very powerful message. This kid is going to spend 12 years there. And they have to have very good place. And the teacher, when they go to teach, they can have the best tools. And that's dignity. It's not a building. It's dignity associated with education. So we do all these things. As I mentioned to you, I'm not going to talk about all these things. They are there. And there are some few things that we work on. But I'm going to give you one more example. And then I'll give you something about public space associated with the whole thing. So we have fellowship for teachers, for principals. We move many things all over the place. It's, it's very extraordinary. It's very, it's very exciting. It takes a lot of time and energy, but we do it. And we can do it, and we have been doing it all over the place. I'll give you two examples. And one that I want to give you, which explains education in a broader sense, it's something that has to do with politics, a message, and all these considerations put together. Something that I, we discussed this morning, which is a good example. When we got there, the first thing, public thing, action in Medellin, and then again, most of these things, we have been doing them for 10 years. And that's powerful because people see that they are and so on, and they continue moving on. But what we did was... We said, we will never going to use a public peso, money, public money, for beauty contest in Medellin. You may say, well, <laughs> well, these guys are weird. No, in Medellin, we had, in Colombia in general, we had beauty contests all over the places. In Medellin in particular, the beauty concept of women is very powerful. So the first thing that we do, and my wife is here, and she led this thing was not a single peso for beauty contest. They said, this guy is crazy. This, go this guy, they are going to destroy the city. How come in Medellin we are going to finish the beauty contest? I said, yes, we are going to finish that right away. <laughs> and not only that, but do you want to organize a beauty contest? Do it with your money. With public funding, zero. But what we are going to create was the Young Women Talent Contest. So women with the same age that they, become, they may be queens from 
18 to 25, for example, we had a contest saying, but the categories were sports, science and technology, uh, social development, art, and so on. And women could participate in that contest from all social sectors, and they will take their projects, and they, we will choose the young woman winner of science and technology in Medellin this year, and she will be the winner. So what's the message? We bet on the education of women, the role of women in transforming society. We bet on people's talent, their dignity, and their capacity, and we make them visible. Now we are doing this in Antioquia. You cannot imagine in these towns, 10,000 people, when they see all these women, young women, showing up, and they start seeing that they have talent. That's very powerful. It's a political decision. It's, it's just a second saying, finish the with, uh, beauty contest, and from now on, we work on women, young women talent. That's powerful, and that's what we got into power, to make those decisions. That particular one, we said, all the money that was spent for this beauty contest, we will put it into the Young Women Talent Contest. And that's how you transform society. That's education in a, in a broader sense. We are betting on all these things. Now, we have to put all these things together. People have to see. So we have fellowship. We have many things we do, and, but people have to be able to see a good deal of what we have done. And it go back to, goes back to what we did, the public space, what we have been build, building, is that everything, every concept that we talked about, education, in the way it may be expressed, it, you have a physical way of understanding it and relating to it. So we have built the most beautiful schools. That's dignity, that's a school. We built the Science and Technology Park in Medellin. We built cultural centers. We built entrepreneurship centers in the poorest towns, in, in the poorest sectors of town. So all what we talked about had a physical expression. And we connected the city. We put together all the tools of development in a particular place. And that's very powerful because people, we will be talking about that and people will be seeing. And something beautiful and ex extraordinary. And that's power. All mayors, governors, presidents, they want to build schools, they want to build cultural centers, libraries, and so on. But when you, what you talk, what you do, is related to what you build, that's really powerful. And that's what we have been doing. So, for example, we did that throughout Medellin. And how do we do that in a small town with 10,000 people? So what we do is we have the what we call parques educativos. It's a one single place. In Medellin, we had plenty of, one for culture, science and technology, botanical garden, cultural center, school, and so on. But in a small town, we put all these things together in a place that we call Parque Educativo, the most beautiful place in town. So in order to get a Parque Educativo for your town, you have to take part in a contest. We don't do politics in the traditional sense that I said, you are a mayor here, here you have a Parque Educativo, but you have to vote for my candidate for the next election. You have a contest. I don't care what party you belong to. You are the mayor, I will respect you. But you have a contest and they have to provide the plot, the best. There's plenty of land. But you have to uh, put to the contest the best that you can find in your town. Then you have to mobilize the whole society. Everyone in the town has... They have to know that they are taking part in a constant contest in order to win a Parque Educativo and how they are going to organize. So they have theater, acts, and paintings, all things. The whole town is moving around these things. And they have to present their educational project to transform the town. So the Parque Educativo is one and a half million dollars each one. And we have 80. We had a contest and they won. And they will be designed by a, a unique architect. The architects competed in order to design the building, but they, was, they were donating their work. They didn't charge us anything. They donated their work. We, of course, we paid for what they had to do in the atelier or the, how do you call it, the studio, but their creative work, they donated it. So everyone was putting in there, and we built these places. In those places in these towns, we are building now 80, 
What you are going to find there when you get into these places, I'm going to show you some pictures. The first thing that you are going to see is the place for teachers, maestras y maestros. In every town, we are going to make sure that maestras and maestros get recognized. A very good space in the most beautiful building that the town has is going to be the new attraction where things are going to happen. Everything will be digital. In, we may have a very difficult time in order to get there by road, but with the technology, we get in there. We have the place for entrepreneurship. We have the place for culture. We work with high school and so on, and we all get together at a place where the new things are going to happen. What is that? Hope. We know how to build hope. But all what we talk about has the physical expression in a place that represents our dreams. And that's how we transform society. Now I'm going to show you some pictures to finish. This was a long time ago. Medellin, the most educated. That was our symbol. That's Medellin, a part of it. We, I myself walked through all those places. The upper part of one of the poorest sectors of town. We were going to build this park library. We already had bought the houses. We have to turn them down in order to prepare the plot. And we were building, we were building. There is the building. And in a place, everyone goes to Medellin and they want to go there. They will never go to the rich sector of town to see buildings. They go to see the park library that we built in the poorest part of town where nobody dared to go there. And there they go. For example, this was a corner in Medellin, in a neighborhood, Manrique, for whoever knows Medellin. And we built there an entrepreneurship center for in, an, in a poor neighborhood. So it is like this. So there is the building, beautiful building, but inside you have the Banco of Oportunidades, training for women, people around, about being able to be entrepreneurs, microfinances, and so on. It happens there. This was a school. And we changed that school for that one. Why we did that? It was a political decision. Somebody was said, leave it like that, I don't care. But for us, why, why we do that? We tore down the, build, the walls. The mother can come in here and look inside and see where the kid is going. Something beautiful. The most beautiful thing that has happened in that neighborhood is this building. It's a powerful message. It's a political message that we are giving there. Another one. This was another part of Medellin. Now it's the Science and Technology Park of Medellin. I'm very proud of this. And we did it. And why it is there? Because we got into power. Mm, that's the reason. We put the money, and you, you go to Medellin, everyone go, wants to go there. And that's the Explorer Park. And that's how it is now. You see the, build, the trees and everything. We built the boulevard. We put together the, Medellin, the, the city. We connected the city. Nobody would ever dare to walk around here. And now it's a wonderful place, right in front of this. This used to be the bot Botanical Garden of Medellin. Now it is like that. We did it, but that was a, our political purpose. Now you can walk. The cultural center in a very poor neighborhood designed by whoever knows about design and architects, Salmona, the most important architect in Colombian history, he designed this in a very poor sector. And that, there it is. And why it is there? Because we got into power and said, we are going to have a cultural center here. That's another example. This is something that I like. Here, this is, these are two barrios in Medellin. I don't know how many people were killed there, from one side to the other. The same people, of course. And now we build the bridge, and we connect. And people don't kill each other right now. It used to be like that, now it is like this. And now we go to Antioquia. I'm, I'm about, to, about to finish. Now we are in Antioquia, the most educated. I'm going to show you the edu Parques Educativos. Let's see. We have what we call the integral municip municipal plans. Integral means something that is very common in politics. You have to have an integral solution to a problem. Good. That's very difficult to put together different secretaries, for example, in your government, to have a single project and get all of us together in order to achieve something that's almost impossible. In traditional political terms, it's impossible because this secretary belongs to this group. This other secretary belongs to somebody who is not in there. We are able to get together, 
because we don't split power. We don't negotiate to, with anyone in order to get into power. We get there and we go there and that's what we wanted. But th this is something very interesting. This is Vigia del Fuerte. This is by the Atrato River. This is a jungle the, out there. Right in front of Vigia del Fuerte, for some of you who may know about Colombia, is Bojaya. It's in Chocó. That's a place that was bombed by FARC, actually, and they killed 100 people who were hiding in a church. It's right across the river. The same people, some of them are in Chocó, they are here in Antioquia, in Vigia del Fuerte. 5,000 people, this is the urban center, but 5,000 people around this place. In order to get there, you have to fly, and there are two or three flights a week there, or you have to take the Atrato River, go all the way up to the ocean, and it will take you more than eight hours to get there. That's Vigia del Fuerte. And what we are doing in there, well, these are three girls from Vigia del Fuerte. That's the social mobilization. Most 95% black people. We have indigenous people and mestizos, but very few, very poor. This is the plot that they put for because they won the contest. They, were, they are one of the 80 parques educativos that we are going to build. Actually, next week, a week from today, we have to inaugurate the first park educativo. It's going to be there. And so this is the plot that they put in there. This is how it should look like. This is, was the design by the architect. And, and that's how it is right now. They are with the final touches. But next week, we inaugurate it. Something unexpected in that town. Very poor. And in that town, we also are building a sports complex. And in that town, here is the Escuela for Indígenas, en Beda. And that's the escuela that they had. This is the design of the one that we designed for them. And here is how it is now. And next week, we inaugurate Parque Educativo, the, sc the school for the indigenous people, the Emberas, the sport complex in a town that has never dreamed that something could happen. And we have mobilized the whole community. And that is happening in Vigia Fuerte. Other part of Antioquia, Apartado, we are building the, like, the equivalent of the California State University the University of Antioquia, in Apartado. We are building a university there. I don't have time to give you more details. Let's go to the mountains. This is a town in the middle of the mountains, Peque. That's, we, that's real people. <laughs> and that's a real path. And here we are with all these people from the mountains. And here's the plot that they gave. And this is the park that they are going to have, and we are already building it. Another place in Antioquia, Santa Rosa. Social mobilization all over the place. All the kids in Antioquia, they were dreaming about Parque Educativo. That's the plot, and that's how it is going to get. It, we are building it. Cáceres, in another part of Antioquia. The mobilization you can see the people that we have in Antioquia with all our faces, our colors, our dreams. This used to be the prison there, the, the jail in Cáceres. Aquí estará our parque educativo. They want it. They are building it now, and this is going to be in there. Anorí. I don't know how many times Anorí has been attacked by the guerrillas. More than 50 years under attack. In the middle of the mountains. There it is, Anorí. That's the social mobilization. Everyone in Anori knew, knew that they have won the Parque Educativo. They took part in it. And this is how it is going to get. We are building it. John Doe by the Magdalena River, another type of town. I don't give you details. And everyone is dreaming about John Doe and in John Doe about the Parque Educativo. That's the plot, and that's how it is going to get. We are already, it's under construction. Guatapé, a beautiful place in another part of Antioquia, so that you can see beautiful. Antioquia is very beautiful. Colombia is really beautiful. So this is the social mobilization. Everyone, tenemos parque educativo. This is a party. We, are, we mean happiness, dreams. And it is going to be here, and it's going to be like that. And this is the last one. <laughs> TTDV in the mountains. It's a coffee town. 
This is the party that we have in the main plaza celebrating that they have a Parque Educativo. All sorts of cultural expression, kids from all over the place, the teachers, everyone is moving around. That's, those are their expressions. This is the building. We are building it right now. It should be finished in a month. This is an old picture. Thomas is, I forgot I have one more in the mountains. <laughs> that's the plot. That's how it should look like. And that's how it is now. And I think I'm finished now. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, before we get into questions, uh, I just have a brief comment. I said this would be a two-part introduction. You've already given the second part, the works. But I just want to add my own experience with this in Medellin in a very brief anecdote. You mentioned the journey from fear to hope. That is a long, tough journey. Uh, the difficulty of transformation is very real, let alone by a mayor or even a governor. I visited Sergio Fajardo shortly after he became governor. And I had seen this extraordinary photo of the library. And the notion of dignity as space is a very powerful one. So some friends that I was with in Colombia, and I was with Beatriz Mons, who some of you know also teaches here, and they said, we must go see this library. One was from Medellin. There were three. Uh, and by the time we got around to it, it was already dark. And they wanted to go into one of the poorest areas of the city after dark. I'm from Detroit. I was born and raised in Detroit. There are certain things I don't do after dark. So we took a subway. Uh, this is actually, uh, this, hold this for a minute. This is the library that you saw in this poor area after dark. On the way, we took the subway, and in the subway stop, when you were mayor, was this library filled after dark with young people at computers, with young people reading books, filled after dark. The dignity of space in this poor area also meant an aerial tram that runs continuously that allows people to save an hour of walking up a hill at the end of a workday. This is the aerial tram. All this is a brief introduction to a small anecdote. On the way back from the library, there were six of us in this car. You're seeing three, Beatriz Mons, myself, and a young man maybe 15 years old. So we started talking, coming down. And we said, uh, do you live in this neighborhood? He said, no, no. I live in the neighborhood on the hill next to it. It's just like this neighborhood. What are you doing here? He said, well, I really like this library a little better. Uh, every day after school, I come to this library. The community space, the dignity of space. That was very moving. And then we asked, what do you plan, what are you studying, what would you like to do? He said, well, I'm trying to decide. I'm trying to decide between being an engineer or being a medical doctor. What extraordinary hope that young man had. To get to that point, we don't know the outcome, but to get to that point from fear to the choice between a medical doctor and an engineer tells me a lot about the works that you have done under the most difficult of circumstances that at least in this small instance captures that journey. So that's the second part of my You're introduction. Awesome.
we have, unfortunately, not much time, but we have some time for questions and comments. Yes. And in your comment about how so many students are saying how much they want to go to school, I worked with a group of 11-year-olds. They were bright. They were enthusiastic. They were motivated. They loved school. And I'm going to be going back and trying to create a program for them, and I was hoping it could be with the University of Antioquia to... Um, keep them in contact with the university to everything from field trips to mentors. Some of the people I work with had ideas, but usually they don't talk to them till they're 17 about college. So are there any resources, any f programs already in place that I could piggyback on with these children from it, just even talking to university students who are as poor as they were and have continued in college. We have many programs. Now, I'm not the mayor, I'm the <laughs> governor. <laughs> well, I was, I was and, <laughs> but you write me an email and I put in touch with people from the city that I'm sure there are many things that can be done. And Again, when I say I'm not the mayor, I'm the governor, it means that I'm careful with Medellin. I move out on the side because many people actually, hardly, they still call me mayor. After all these years, they still call me mayor. <laughs> I'm the governor. And somebody said, he is the governor of Medellin. <laughs> Just to show the confusion, but it's a nice confusion in the sense that we put our lives there in Medellin. So many people, when they see me, they see Medellin major, and they ask me. So, of course, when there are problems with violence and all these things, they tell me, why don't you do something? I said, I am the governor. But we can, I'm sure there are many programs. I'll give you my email. You write to me, and I put in, you in touch with people who can work with you. Just, there are many just one short thought, though. Is the university state-funded, and are there are programs that the university could establish rather than the city of Medellin. The, the, it's a state funded, it's nationally funded, a state funds. Actually, the government of Medellin puts zero pesos in the University of Antioquia, but most students are from Medellin. But Medellin is part of Antioquia. And so there are many things that can be done with the university within Medellin. And I'll give you my address and I'll put you in touch with someone who may help you or work Medellin, with you. Medellin I'm happy yes. to hear that. Uh, with the black sweater over there, yes. And following up uh, the same kind of question, for some of the Colombians that we live here and we had the opportunity to get higher education, my question is, how can we help? How, <laughs> there is anything that, that, that we can integrate. I, I have tried, but I had to as, uh, admit that I haven't been the most eager, <laughs> and I haven't done anything. But hearing your talk, it says, okay. I got to do something. I got to <laughs> give to my country a little bit of what I had Good. in education. I'll tell you what to do. Study a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm learned a lot, opened your mind, know the world, and then you go back. And that's quite a lot. And you will see what you can do. But at least you are conscious that belong to a country, to a society, that you are privileged by the fact that you are here, and that we can all give back to our society to make it better. And that's it. Then maybe you get involved with politics, you help with something, you will see, but as of now, study a lot. Learn, enjoy this beautiful place. The beautiful people, the interesting people from all over. And when you go back, you remain a Colombian and you have a, a mind which is open. And life will tell you. So don't worry too much. <laughs> but go back. Go back there and there is plenty of work that you will find there. Sometimes there are obstacles, difficult times. That's part of life. I would just like to comment briefly. We have a lot of questions. I think we're going to have to have you back. Uh, 
to answer whatever we don't get to tonight. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, so I'm from Mexico. I'm uh, from a place called Oaxaca. And I have been, well, I'm a scientist now. I'm, I, I have been studying here in the U.S. for quite some time. And I would like to go back. Um, I want to learn as much as possible, as you said. But um, my passion is to find some renewable energy, that kind of thing. For That's why I'm studying. But until now, I, my dream was to do this transition of being to science or academia and then going into politics because I believe that that's the ultimate um, way to do some changes. And up to now, I thought that was an impossible dream. So it opened up my mind that that's actually possible. So my question is, um, once you, how did you do this transition or how was the process for you to do the transition of academia into politics, and what would be your advice for, let's say, this new generation that now gets inspired by what you have done in Colombia and your friends? Okay, I'll, I'll try to explain briefly. I was always interested on the society that I lived on. You may be a mathematician, an engineer, a physicist, whatever, a scientist with very difficult and deep problems that you may be working on. But I myself was always worried and I cared about the society where I lived. So I paid attention. I read many things from different fields and all these things relate to different people, regardless of the fact that I was a mathematician and I wasn't supposed to be interested in different things. But I, I always paid attention. Pay attention. You are curious. You have to learn from many languages, understand many things. And things happen in life. When you, have, when you feel deeply, well, some of the things that we do from, uh, from sciences in general is you are disciplined. You know how to work. You have to persist, remain working. Obstacles, there are plenty of obstacles. If we had a stop in front of the first obstacle that we found 14 years and a half ago, I wouldn't be here. But we continued. But we had the passion, the conviction. I mean, we <coughs> knew, and I, I was the leader of this thing, but I said, we're going to do it. The same thing that I, would, I was going to do in math, I wanted to work with this professor, I wanted to work in this extraordinary subject of mathematics and with this guy that I found... Uh, amazing, and I wanted to learn about it and to be part of it, you have to have the conviction. Smart people, plenty around. As smarter than you and I, many. But with you put together being smart, being uh, passionate, with deep, deep conviction about what you're doing in life, and you put all those together, that's different. So it may happen. And you have to be alert. I tell people who work at the university, go back and work at the university. The university is a good place to be in, in some senses. Yeah. I liked it very much. I loved what I did. But I knew that I had to do other things. But the university gives you room. You have the chance to talk to people, to see different things. To, you have students, which is something that is always going to be interesting and, and good, so that you enjoy. And then life moves, and suddenly you see a light and follow it. It may be politics, but you are going to be part of Mexican society, Latin American, and you will contribute. And one, you may find your place. That's the formula. <laughs> uh, one quick announcement. We will be uh, having this uh, w a webcast on the website of the Center for Latin American Studies in the next several days at claas.berkeley.edu. We have time for two very quick questions all the way in the back. What are you going for today? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. 
<laughs> but it's not that I want. I don't want to answer. We gave. It was a perfectly serious decision when 14 and a half years ago we said we're going to get into politics. We want to get into power, and we want to transform the society. Politics is about power. And uh, as I said, we have been following a path which is difficult many times. There are some things about politics that I dislike deeply. I still dislike because my approach to life is the approach of a, of a mathematician with ideals, with dreams. And once you get into power, you see that power, we can do extraordinary things. But at the same time, power can get the worst out of people. And many things happen in this world, and you see them in front of you. And I claim that corruption is a, una empresa criminal more difficult to fight than guerrillas or narco-traffickers. I claim that corruption is m far more difficult. And they are all over the place. I don't know how many demands I get. Basically, every day I get demanded. Because we are a threat. They want my head. In the sense that they say they, we want to destroy these things. So it's, it's, there is a very dirty world out there. At the same time, there is something extraordinary. And many times, when I come here, then I look back and say, the university. <laughs> <laughs> how nice. <laughs> this is wonderful. Drinking Café Estrada, yeah, exactly. Estrada <laughs> and walking around and all these things. And he tells me, why don't you come here afterwards? And I said, maybe. <laughs> I cannot be a mathematician like him now. I cannot, I cannot do research now what I used to do. But I, sometimes I have said, when I get older, I would like to be a rector of a university. I would like to go back. But... It's wide open, and I know that we will be facing that question soon after I finish being governor, and I know that there are many people who share our spirit, and we may have differences, of course, but I claim, and I feel, and I, and I know, because I moved around the country after I was the mayor of Medellin with Mocus, I was my presidential candidate, I walked around, and I know, I know that there are plenty of people that in Colombia we can change things. But sometimes it's hard. And, but life goes on. We will see. One very quick question in the white shirt. Yes. Very quick. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. I was wondering whether you could tell us a little bit more about where the funding comes from. You already mentioned that the uh, municipal level is not involved in funding the university, for example, but that it's funded by the state level and by the central government. I was wondering whether you could tell us a little bit more about the roles of the different levels of government in funding this. Okay. But I tell you an anecdote, something that happened to me once. For some reason, Harley doesn't know this. <laughs> for some reason, when I was the mayor of Medellin, I went to Switzerland. I don't remember. Well, the United Nations in Switzerland. And I gave a talk at the United Nations General Headquarters in, in Geneva. I never thought I would do that. And actually, I don't even have a picture to show <laughs> the city. I was there. Anyway, so we got to meet the guy who runs the World Economic Forum at Davos. Somebody told me, why don't we go and visit him? I said, well, let's go. And we went there, we talked to him, I talked to him, and I explained with my hand, uh, my, my handbook, explained what we were doing about Medellin, and he said, why don't you come to Davos next year? And I said, sure, I'll go. I thought, this guy is not going to invite me. Well, then I got a letter asking me to go to Davos, and I went to Davos. And it was... Interesting, an interesting experience. The figure there was Bono, Bill Clinton, <laughs> I don't know who else. But anyway, I was, I was there. And then I had an interview with a journalist from a very small town in Switzerland. I don't know which town. And I don't know why she was going to interview me. Somebody told her or something. And there, these very young women come to talk to me. 
And we were talking, and, and I was telling about park libraries and all these things that we were going to do. And this woman would look at me with her eyes wide open and said, this cannot be lived. And suddenly I realized, when I see this young woman, I said, she's thinking that I am a narco-trafficker. <laughs> I had that because I was telling all these things, and they said she couldn't believe, and I was very happy about what we were doing. I'll show you her the designs and all these things. And she said, I, that's what I felt. I never asked her. But I felt this woman is saying, this guy is the mayor of Medellin. And look what he's telling me that he's going to do. That cannot be. That's what I felt. Not that I felt that with you. <laughs> I remember. Because he said, where does the money come from? <laughs> because this couldn't be possible that in Medellin, Colombia, we could have the most beautiful building in the whole world. How come we? And all this story to tell you that we, we have plenty of money. We have many resources. Of course, we would like to have more. We need money, of course. It's, uh, it, but... The first thing in order to fund this is don't steal a single peso. And that money, you will see the money invested here because I claim that in the hands and the pockets of corrupt people, there are plenty of park libraries, fellowships, all these things that have been stolen from our people by corrupt people in power. So the first thing is don't steal a single peso and money will last and you can do many things. That's the first thing. It's crucial. Because the corrupt people, they know very well how to do things. It's, it's incredible. And for example, some people say, well, okay, it's okay that they steal money, but they have to do something. Show some buildings. And that's part of the perception. There are some places in Colombia that say they stole the whole thing. But at least you show something. And that's acceptable to many people in Colombia. So don't steal a single peso. Now... The way we finance things in Colombia is li like this. The central government basically collects most of our taxes, and they have to redistribute those taxes throughout the country. At the municipal level, you have some taxes, the property tax and some el IVA. I forgot how you... Uh, uh, small. Okay. And that you have at the municipal level. At the a regional level, a state level, is more difficult because we have taxes associated with alcohol and cigarettes and a few other taxes, but few taxes. And those are the ways you finance things in Colombia. And, for example, in Medellin, when I was the mayor of Medellin, I had more resources than I have now as governor of Antioquia for the whole state. But that's plenty of money. I claim, how much money do you have? Enough. We, that's the money that we have, and we have to make sure that it works. So you can collect all these things. But when people trust you, they pay. So you can see how much money they are paying once they feel that they are, their money has, is not being stolen. So we can collect a lot of money. Medellin in particular, Medellin, has a public utilities company which is very powerful, which is publicly owned and they transfer from their gains a lot of money to Medellin. And that helps. At the state of Antioquia, we have in Antioquia the liquor, la fabrica de licores de Antioquia. And they transfer money to us. So if you go to Antioquia, you should drink aguardiente, don't drive while <laughs> under the influence, all these things, but drink a lot carefully because that's money for us. But we got those sources, and we know how to put the money, where to put the money. The national government give, they, has some money. And my claim is if we do a good tax reform in Colombia, because we don't have it, but there is plenty of money. I mean, of course, we need much more. But with the, one that we ha with the money that we have, if we use it wisely, without stealing a single peso, many things can happen. And what happened in Medellin could happen all over the place, I claim. I can answer uh, more questions. Sure. No, on that note, we've just begun the conversation. 
I want to thank everyone for coming, and I want to thank Sergio Fajardo for being here with us.